Welcome back to Introduction to Higher Mathematics. In our last lecture, we began to see relationships between groups that show up in all sorts of different areas of mathematics. We looked at the idea of symmetry, which is what we call the ability to apply transformations to an object that will leave it looking identical. We demonstrated the symmetry with the dihedral groups, which comprise the rotations and reflections of two-dimensional geometric figures. After noticing some similarities between some groups, we define the concept of a homomorphism, a function between two sets that preserves some operations on those sets. That is, f of a star b equals f of a pound f of b. We then saw that if our homomorphism f also happens to be a bijection, then it's a special type of function called an isomorphism. We discovered that if two groups are isomorphic to each other, then they're basically the same under the hood, share the same properties, and work exactly the same way. Finally, we explored equivalence classes of isomorphic groups, seeing how pervasive they are in many seemingly disparate fields of mathematics. Well, here we are at the end of our course. It's been quite a journey, hasn't it? We started off with almost nothing, except for bare propositional logic. But little by little, we built on that logic, starting with sets, collections of objects. Those sets helped us to further upgrade our logic from propositional logic to predicate logic. All the while, we were building techniques for proofs, so we could prove that the things we were about to see were indeed true. With sets defined, we started to link them together with relations, such as equivalence relations and order relations. And soon, special kinds of relations called functions, which give us ways to move from one set to another. Then, we started poking at the numbers themselves, delving into number theory, where we're still trying to uncover the mysteries of prime numbers, and looking briefly at modular arithmetic, essential to encryption algorithms today. We wrestled with the meaning of infinity, and after seeing that there were different sizes of it, we began an investigation of the real numbers. We started by building our number systems from the ground up, the natural numbers out of Peano's axioms, then the integers, rationals, and reals on top of each other in succession. Then we took two different approaches to analyze the real numbers. The approach of topology, where we looked at open and closed sets, and the approach of sequences, where we looked at lists of numbers and where they were going. Understanding the real numbers just a bit better we started to look for even more structure when different numbers, or other mathematical objects, were combined. This led us into the realm of abstract algebra, where we were introduced to groups, which equipped sets with a binary operation that followed a set of rules. And what a variety of groups there were! Wanting more, we went even further and found rings, which had two binary operations, which acted just like addition and multiplication, and then fields which fleshed out the rudimentary multiplication of rings until we basically had the four classical operations we're used to, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Finally, in one last sweeping motion, we brought the groups we had seen together and connected them under the unifying idea of isomorphism. So now the question presents itself. Now what? Where does the road lead from here? Mathematics as a subject is incredibly broad and yet incredibly deep. There are in fact many directions in which you could go in your studies. Depending on the field you're going to pursue, the sciences, economics, business, computers, even history or philosophy, there are different areas of mathematics you may want to study, which would give you the tools to analyze your field in a logical way. Or you could be like me and enjoy mathematics for its own sake. Don't worry, there's a place for you too. Anyway, what I'd like to do at this point is introduce you to these areas of mathematics, give you an idea of what each one's about, and what purpose it has. So one of the first classes that comes in handy for a number of reasons, and actually the one I'd suggest you look into next, is called linear algebra, which can be thought of as the study of linear transformations. We talked about transformations a bit last lecture, when we were describing symmetries in the dihedral groups but there are tons of different ways we can transform a geometrical object. Not only can we rotate or reflect it, we can stretch it, we can squish it, we can translate it, we can shear it, we can bend it, 
We can twist it. We can flatten it. We can even reduce it to a single point. To be a linear transformation, a transformation must preserve the origin and preserve straight lines. This means we don't usually talk about translations as linear transformations. Those are actually called affine transformations, but they do have their uses as well. Now this sounds very geometric in nature, so where does the algebra come in? Well, the tools we often work with in linear algebra are vectors and matrices. Usually when we first talk about vectors, we mean Euclidean vectors, which are basically elements of R to the n, that is, n-tuples of real numbers. Given the world in which we live, we most often find ourselves working with R squared and R cubed. So in linear algebra, you'd be getting to know these two spaces very well, though it's not uncommon to work with higher dimensions as well. Besides, vectors don't just have to represent direction and magnitude, as they do in geometry and physics. They can represent the current state of any system that has multiple properties we want to analyze. For instance, we might represent the amounts of current in each branch of a circuit as a vector. Then, matrices are, of course, arrays of numbers. Or we could even think of them as vectors of vectors. Though you should be familiar with their basic algebraic properties, we did find, after all, that they're rings, it turns out that they're the perfect tool for representing linear transformations. There are matrices that can rotate vectors, stretch them, reflect them, and so on. The determinant of a square matrix comes in handy here. It actually tells you how much the area or volume of a geometrical object will be scaled by a transformation. Using vectors and matrices, we begin to explore the properties of various spaces. For instance, we might look at linear combinations of vectors. Given some set of vectors, we might be interested in all possible linear combinations of those vectors. We would call this the span of those vectors. For instance, two vectors would span a plane, as long as they're not parallel to each other, of course. We then might ask whether a particular vector is in the span of some other set of vectors. This is useful when we're solving systems of equations. We might solve this by representing the system of equations by a matrix and manipulating the rows piece by piece until we've found our solution. Sometimes we're given a space and we're asked to find a set of vectors that can be combined together to span that whole space. We call this a basis for the space. After that, we might want to find a particularly convenient basis, perhaps made of vectors of length 1, or vectors that are orthogonal, that is, perpendicular, to each other. Or even vectors that never change direction under some transformation, such as the blue vector in this shear transformation, which we call eigenvectors. Things get really interesting when we consider abstract vector spaces. Similar to how we can find groups anywhere, there are a lot of constructs in mathematics that act like vectors, such as polynomials or particular kinds of functions. Thus, we can use the tools of linear algebra to attack a wide variety of problems. The next subject I'd like to talk about, and one of the most important ones for the sciences, is the study of calculus. Developed independently by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz, calculus lets us answer the question, when we make very small changes in one quantity, what happens to other quantities that are related to it? An introductory calculus class usually first begins with a thorough examination of the concept of limits, which you were introduced to in our lecture on sequences. We can use limits to study the behavior of functions. Even if we can't evaluate a function at some particular input, we can let our inputs get very close and see what happens to the output. After limits, calculus is usually broken up into two parts, differential calculus and integral calculus. You're no doubt already familiar with the slope of a line. Given any two points on the line, the slope is the difference in the y-coordinates divided by the difference in the x-coordinates, which we might write as delta y over delta x. Differential calculus generalizes this concept and lets you find, in essence, the slope of a curve, called the derivative, instead written as dy over dx. It's found by making the two points we use to measure the slope incredibly close, infinitely close to each other, giving us the slope of the tangent line to that function, which we can also think of as the rate of change. 
Since functions can have all sorts of ups and downs, the derivative will change at various points along a function. This opens up all sorts of new relationships between functions. For instance, the derivative of a quadratic function can be described as a linear function. The derivative of a linear function is a constant, since the slope is just a single number. And the derivative of a constant function, a horizontal line, is zero. Derivatives have many uses, such as finding the relative maxima and minima of a function, which we call optimization. In fact, optimization is a branch of mathematics of its own that's useful for all sorts of applications, such as minimizing energy consumption or maximizing profit. We can even find derivatives of derivatives, called second derivatives, and so on, which tell us about the concavity and curvature of a graph. On the other hand, integral calculus tackles the problem of area. While up to now you've learned how to calculate areas of simple shapes like circles, triangles, and rectangles, the integral of a function lets us calculate the area under any curve. It's written as an elongated S because it's a special kind of summation. We can easily approximate the area under a curve by trying to fit a bunch of rectangles into the curve in what we call a Riemann sum. Then to get the exact area, we imagine that the rectangles are infinitely thin and that there are infinitely many of them, which lets us sort of smooth out the shape. We can extend the idea to find the volumes of various 3D geometrical figures, letting us see for ourselves where certain formulas actually come from. The big shocker is what's known as the fundamental theorem of calculus, which basically says that differentiation, the process of finding the derivative, and integration, the process of calculating the integral, are inverses of each other, two sides of the same coin. Both derivatives and integrals are essential in physics to describe the laws of motion. One other topic covered in a basic calculus class is the idea of infinite series. Suppose you start with 1, then add 1 half, then 1 fourth, then 1 eighth, and so on, adding half the amount each time. If we look at the sequence formed by the partial sums, that is, the sums of the first certain number of terms, we would find they converge to 2. So we'd say that the infinite sum is 2. Calculus introduces a number of new ways to tell if a series, that is, the sum of a sequence, will converge. This becomes incredibly useful when we realize that we can approximate entire functions using Taylor series. Infinite polynomials that can be made to approximate many functions to any degree of accuracy. In the grand scheme of things, polynomials are rather easy to work with, especially in calculus, so this is a very useful tool to have. All of the calculus we've been describing so far is known as single variable calculus, where we only really deal with functions of a single variable. The next step is to study multivariable calculus which deals with functions of two or more variables. Instead of curves, functions of two variables make surfaces. Functions of three or more variables are quite a bit harder to visualize, but we could study them anyway. Many of our concepts from single variable calculus become more generalized. If we have a function of two variables, we may only want to change one variable at a time. We would do this by holding one variable constant, slicing the surface to make a more familiar function for which we can find the derivative. This is what we call a partial derivative. On the other hand, integrals are generalized into double integrals, which let us find the volume under a surface, and triple integrals, which, well, there's no good way to describe what a triple integral looks like, but for instance, we could use it to find the overall mass of a three-dimensional object, given its density and its shape splitting it into tiny chunks and adding them all up. Closely related to multivariable calculus is vector calculus, which, as you can probably guess, applies the concepts of calculus to vectors and is essential to understanding fluid dynamics and electromagnetism. Vector calculus introduces the concept of a vector field, in which every point in a plane or in space has a vector associated with it. For instance, you may have seen field lines of a magnet describing the magnitude and direction of the magnetic force at any given point. The idea of the slope or the derivative is extended to become the gradient.
which is a vector field built from partial derivatives. On a surface, the gradient always points in the direction of the steepest uphill of that surface. Also, vector calculus lets us analyze these vector fields with two quantities called divergence and curl. For instance, if we imagine a vector field describing the flow of a fluid like water, the divergence of the vector field would give you an idea of whether the water would be moving toward or away from certain points. And the curl would give you an idea of how rotational the flow is, such as whether there are any whirlpools that would make a rough ball spin if it were submerged. We can also look at the cumulative effects of a vector field as we move through it along a curve in a plane or in space. This is what we call a line integral. Another area of calculus that's often used in many sciences like biology and chemistry, as well as economics, is the study of differential equations. Differential equations, or DIFFEQ as it's often lovingly abbreviated, answers the question, how is a function related to its own derivatives? Or, if we know that a function is related to its derivatives in some certain way, can we figure out what the original function was? For example, consider population growth. Suppose a population grows such that its rate of growth is proportional to its population at the time. In other words, the more creatures, the more breeding going on, and thus the more growth. What kind of function would act like this? The answer is an exponential function. As you'll learn in calculus, if the population is described by the general form p equals c times e to the kt, the growth, that is the derivative, will be equal to that same thing multiplied by k. Physicists often take differential equations one step further and study partial differential equations, or PDEs for short, which as you might imagine involve partial derivatives, and can be used to study phenomena such as sound and heat, as well as quantum mechanics. By contrast, by the way, the first kind of diffie Qs are often called ordinary differential equations, or ODEs for short. Solving differential equations is somewhat of an art form, because rather than having a tried and true method for solving any differential equation under the sun, we more often look at an equation and ask ourselves, hmm, where have I seen something like this before? Based on our observation, we try any of a number of different methods, some of which may be more successful than others in coming up with a solution. In both ordinary and partial differential equations, having studied linear algebra comes in quite handy and gives an idea of where the various solution methods come from and why they work, or sometimes why they don't. Some equations don't even have a good way to solve them algebraically. For these kinds of problems, we instead turn to a branch of math called numerical analysis which studies processes that can be used to arrive at approximate numerical solutions for problems in mathematics. For instance, as we mentioned when we introduced abstract algebra, general solutions exist for quadratic, cubic, and quartic equations. But for quintic equations and above, there are no algebraic solutions that use only the simple tools of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and roots. So instead, we might use various numerical methods, developed by mathematicians such as Newton, Gauss, Lagrange, and Euler, and based on the fundamentals of linear algebra and calculus, to approximate the solutions to these sorts of equations to some given degree of accuracy. When we study numerical analysis, we often want to know, is some approximation guaranteed to converge to the exact result? And how fast does it do so? Numerical analysis is especially of importance to computer scientists, who not only want to design effective algorithms that balance accuracy and runtime, but also must be careful that their algorithms are stable. Otherwise, in a large enough program or a large enough input, a tiny round-off or truncation error can cause a huge discrepancy in the final solution. So these different branches of calculus all rest firmly on the real numbers which is a set that can be thought of as continuous. But there's also an entirely different branch of mathematics called discrete mathematics, which focuses on mathematical structures that come in pieces or chunks, such as the natural numbers or the integers. Discrete math has especially been of interest since the latter half of the 20th century, because computers store data in discrete amounts, individual zeros and ones, that cannot be further broken down. 
we've already covered many of the preliminary topics that are covered by an introductory discrete math class. Logic and truth tables, sets and cardinality, relations, functions, and modular arithmetic, as well as proof techniques, especially proof by mathematical induction. After this point, there are a number of subtopics that can be covered, each of which can then be explored in its own right. One of the most common topics to be first associated with discrete math is the study of combinatorics, a rather fancy name that really just means counting. In combinatorics, we want to count everything. Secure passwords, winning poker hands, and so on. Three things that we often study in combinatorics are permutations, which, as you've seen in our previous lectures, are arrangements of some number of objects. Combinations, which are subsets of a given size taken from a larger overall set of objects, so order no longer matters. And partitions, which are ways to split up the elements of some set of objects into non-overlapping subsets. Of great importance is a thorough understanding of sets and cardinality, as well as functions, whether they be injective, surjective, or bijective. Many different problems can be phrased in terms of trying to count how many functions there are from one set to another that have certain properties. This class is also where the pigeonhole principle is usually first introduced. A love for creative problem solving is the key to combinatorics, in which there are often many ways to imagine problems, such as arranging patterns of stars and bars, sorting balls into bins, or even placing rooks on a chessboard. Another well-known topic in discrete math is graph theory. You were briefly introduced to graphs when we talked about relations. Remember that in these terms, a graph is a collection of points called vertices and lines between those vertices called edges. But there's much, much more to graph theory. We've only really scratched the surface. For instance, we're often interested in traversing a graph, moving between the vertices along the various edges. Sometimes we're looking for Eulerian paths, which traverse each edge exactly once, just like the bridges of Konigsberg. Or Hamiltonian paths, which touch each vertex exactly once, a key idea behind the traveling salesman problem, in which we're looking for the shortest possible route between cities that visits every city at least once and returns to where we started. Sometimes we're interested in whether two graphs are isomorphic, which in this case means that they have the exact same relationships between their vertices and their edges. Sometimes we're interested in coloring the graph, either the vertices or the edges, in any number of different ways, depending on what we want to do, whether you're a store manager scheduling his employees for their shifts, or a Sudoku fanatic attempting a brutal puzzle. And graph theory provides a very visual way to analyze problems from almost any field of mathematics, from combinatorics to geometry to group theory. Though discrete math is thought of as being the opposite of more continuous kinds of math, we can often use more manageable ideas from discrete math to better understand more continuous mathematical structures. There's even a branch of discrete math called discrete calculus, in which we develop many of the same tools as regular calculus, but instead of applying them to continuous functions, we work with discrete functions, that is, sequences. A common use of discrete calculus is to solve recurrence relations, in which we have a sequence defined not by an explicit formula, but a set of initial conditions and a relation of each term to the ones before it. A great example of this is the Fibonacci sequence, in which the first two terms are 1, and every term afterward is obtained by adding the two terms before it. Amazingly, the methods of solving these recurrence relations actually echo the solution methods for differential equations, making for some very interesting interplay between the continuous and the discrete. A familiar topic that's often expanded upon in discrete math is probability. The study of probability in discrete math begins with the idea of a sample space, which is the set of all possible outcomes of an experiment. For instance, the sample space of a single roll of a die would be the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whereas the sample space for two rolls would be that set's Cartesian product with itself, all possible ordered pairs of integers from 1 to 6. Then, if each outcome is equally likely, the probability of an outcome that satisfies some particular property is the fraction of elements of the sample space that satisfy that property.
the probabilities of different events follow various algebraic laws that are rooted in the concepts of set theory that we've already studied. Once we're familiar with the laws of probability, we can introduce the idea of a random variable, a variable that can, at random, take on the value of any element of the sample space. We can map out the probabilities that the variable will take on these values using what's called a probability distribution. We often want to know, given the probability of each outcome, what values that random variable will usually take on. So we define concepts like the expected value of the variable, which you already know is the mean of everything in the sample space, and both the variance and the standard deviation of the variable, which both give us an idea of how spread out the outcomes will be. The concepts of discrete probability extend nicely to more continuous probability, in which outcomes of a discrete random variable are replaced by a continuous probability distribution, a curve over all possible values of our random variable, the area under which has to equal 1. A good example is the normal distribution, whose shape is often colloquially known as the bell curve. Instead of finding the probability of our random variable equaling any one value, we instead look for the probability that falls within some range of values which can be solved with the tools of integral calculus. Often coupled with the study of probability is the study of statistics. There's some debate as to whether statistics is itself a branch of mathematics, or rather a body of science that uses mathematical tools. Regardless, the focus of statistics is the collection, organization, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data all of which require a thorough understanding of mathematics, especially probability and random variables. In statistics, we examine the principles of effectively designing experiments, studies, and surveys. When the data has been collected, statisticians look for patterns in the data, seeing if they closely fit a model. Perhaps the data seem to be roughly following a straight line, or perhaps a parabola or an exponential curve. Perhaps even there's no relation at all. Either way, we can use our findings about the data to determine what conclusions, if any, we can draw, and whether we can make any predictions based on our results. We often want to know if there's any correlation between two variables, whether they're related in some way, though we have to be careful not to confuse this with causation. Just because global warming has increased as the number of pirates has roughly declined, doesn't mean that the lack of pirates has actually caused global warming. These results are then communicated in the forms of graphs and charts, hopefully made in a way that makes the relationships clear, though, unfortunately, statistics can also be used to cleverly mislead people. But if you know what to look for, you can avoid being fooled by insidious mislabeling of graphs. There's a lot more we can do with an understanding of probability and random variables. We can study stochastic processes, which represent how a random variable changes over time perfect for describing the random motion of gas particles, the rising and falling of the stock market, or the vital readings of a hospital patient. For example, we can analyze processes called Markov chains, using the tools of linear algebra to describe how a system may change between states with some sort of probability, perhaps to model changes in the weather or migration of geese. We can also study game theory which lets us apply the tools of probability to model real-life situations as games and develop the best decision strategies for each player in the game. Some games are zero-sum games, in which whenever one player wins, the other player loses, while others may not be zero-sum games. Perhaps there's a strategy that both players can choose such that each has a favorable outcome. Some games are non-cooperative, in which each player moves independently, Whereas in cooperative games, players can make contracts to cooperate, which are enforceable by a third party. Game theory has applications everywhere, from biology, to economics, to political science, and has been the tool of choice for a number of Nobel Prize winners for their contributions to the world. The subfields of mathematics we've discussed so far have had wide applications in many important real-world scenarios. This is a great reason to study mathematics. It lends itself very well to analyzing and shaping the world around us. But many people, myself included, also like to study mathematics for its own sake, for its beauty and its elegance. The former pursuit might be characterized as applied mathematics, 
whereas the latter might be described as pure mathematics. This may at first sound like a hard line that divides mathematicians neatly between each side, but this is most definitely not the case. Applied mathematics often draws on concepts of pure mathematics, and pure mathematics often gains its inspiration from real-world phenomena. The last few subjects I'd like to describe might be considered more toward the pure end of the spectrum, though they all have their applications to the real world as well. What might surprise you is that we've already discussed the beginnings of many of these topics in this course. The oldest and in some ways the most accessible branch of pure mathematics is number theory, which as we've seen is devoted to the study of the integers. We covered a few topics in number theory, mainly basic notions of divisibility and factorization, Diophantine equations, prime numbers, and modular arithmetic. But we haven't even scratched the surface of the rich body of knowledge of number theory. For instance, even though we're primarily interested in the integers, we often find ourselves looking to the complex numbers for insight as to why the integers act the way they do. We explore the concepts of Gaussian integers, numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are both integers, and Gaussian primes which are numbers that can't be expressed as a product of two Gaussian integers other than in very trivial ways. For instance, the number 2, while a prime in the integers, can be represented as 1 plus i times 1 minus i. So it is not a Gaussian prime. Other topics in number theory include the elusive perfect numbers, which are the sums of their own proper divisors and are intimately related to the Mersenne primes and the mysterious p-adic numbers, a bizarre number system in which two numbers are considered close if they differ by a large power of a prime. Strange things happen in the p-adic numbers. For instance, in the three-adic numbers, the series 1 plus 3 plus 9 plus 27 plus 81, and so on, though it seems to be getting larger and larger without bound, actually converges to negative one-half. How's that for weird? Next up is abstract algebra. Be careful, by the way. Some university programs will simply call this course algebra. The beginnings of abstract algebra should now be familiar to you, as it studies algebraic structures like groups, rings, and fields. But these are only a small part of a rich taxonomy that includes such structures as magmas, semigroups, monoids, near rings, lattices, vector spaces, modules, and even algebras. Yes, you heard that right, algebras, as in plural. We study these structures in terms of what properties are and aren't included. What if we only have a unary operation defined on a set? What if we have a binary operation that's associative but doesn't have an identity? What if we combine a group and a ring? Investigating these questions helps us understand just what various properties can really do for us, and gives us a deeper way to analyze problems from many fields of study from modern theories in physics to solutions of Rubik's cubes. Homomorphisms and isomorphisms, as well as newmorphisms, like endomorphisms and automorphisms, provide insight into how smaller structures are related to each other. By the way, there's even a branch of mathematics called category theory that takes the abstraction even further, analyzing all of these algebraic structures in an even more general way. Next we have real analysis, which studies the properties of the real numbers and functions of real variables. Again, we've touched on the very beginning concepts with our coverage of Dedekind cuts, the supremum property, intervals, sequences, and limits. In real analysis, we more rigorously define intuitive notions like convergence and continuity. And we often investigate a wide range of functions from smooth functions, for which we can take the derivative again and again without running into any problems, to the most eccentric functions we can think of, such as the Dirichlet function, which is 1 at all rational numbers and 0 at all irrational numbers. Try to draw that on a graph. The properties we discover by looking at these functions help us better understand the inner workings of calculus. The derivative, the integral, and the infinite series are revisited going past just knowing how to use them, but instead showing why they work. Another new concept that's introduced in real analysis is the concept of a measure, which is a more formal and general way to define the concept of length, such as the length of an interval. For instance, the Lebesgue measure, 
is what we call the conventional definition of length, area, and volume in Euclidean geometry. We would say the Lebesgue measure of the interval 3 to 8, including 3 not including 8, is 5. But we can use the Lebesgue measure to measure stranger sets, like the Cantor set, which has a measure of 0, despite having an uncountably infinite number of points, and even use this to expand what calculus can do. On the other side of the coin, we can delve into what's known as complex analysis. Complex numbers, as we mentioned before, have their uses. Even though we call the parts of a complex number real and imaginary, there's nothing imaginary about complex numbers at all. They very much exist in the real world, and have applications in thermodynamics, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering. Thus it's useful to extend our functions of real variables to be able to evaluate complex variables as well. The task of graphing a function with two-dimensional inputs and two-dimensional outputs seems at first like an insurmountable task as it would require four dimensions. But the advent of computer graphics has made us visualize functions from C to C by using color. Given a point on the complex plane, the hue indicates the angle or argument of the complex output, and the intensity indicates the size or modulus of the output. Just about all the functions you learned about in your algebra class can take in complex inputs. The results are often surprising. For instance, the function e to the z, where z is a complex number, is actually periodic, but along the imaginary axis. Or, unlike what you may have been told in grade school, you can, in a way, take the logarithm of a negative number. And there even exist complex numbers that have a sine or cosine of 2. From there, the tools of calculus are applied to these new functions, which can in turn help us solve calculus problems involving only real numbers with more sophisticated tools. Complex analysis even has applications in number theory. Remember that the Riemann hypothesis may be the key to learning more about the distribution of prime numbers. Moving in a slightly different direction, the study of geometry takes on some interesting new directions in higher mathematics, as there are many ways to approach it. We can more closely examine the Euclidean geometry we're used to, perhaps focusing on constructions, involving only a straight edge and a compass, seeing what we can build with limited tools. We can study transformational geometry, which focuses on transformations of geometrical objects, much like we've seen when talking about groups, and which transformations preserve properties like distances between points or angles between lines. We can study projective geometry, inspired by the use of perspective in art, in which angles aren't what they seem, and parallel lines can be said to meet at a point at infinity. We can study inversive geometry, which takes geometrical objects and turns them inside out, perhaps through a circle or a sphere, giving us an interesting way to more simply solve many difficult problems in geometry. We can, of course, study non-Euclidean geometry, which we talked about briefly in Lecture 2 seeing what happens when we ditch the parallel postulate and instead end up with spherical or hyperbolic geometry, each of which has its own unique and surprising properties. We can study taxicab geometry, which replaces the typical Euclidean metric with a somewhat simpler metric, restricting our motion to right angles, just like a taxicab moving through the streets of Manhattan. With this new metric, the shortest path between two points may no longer be a straight line, and often isn't even unique. We can study differential geometry, which applies the techniques of linear algebra and calculus to geometry, such as the study of differentiable manifolds, which are spaces that, even though they may be curved, appear to be Euclidean when viewed closely. For instance, the surface of the Earth is spherical if viewed from a distance, but if you zoom in closely enough, we see it and can treat it as if it were flat. Finally, closely related with geometry is topology, which as we've seen is a study of the basic properties of space. We discussed point set topology, which is mostly concerned with open sets, and is often referred to in the study of real analysis. However, perhaps the most well-known kind of topology is geometric topology, which studies the manifolds we just talked about, their properties, and functions usually called maps between them. By the way, there's also an algebraic topology, which seeks to study topology using the ideas of abstract algebra. Topologists study properties such as connectedness and orientation, 
concerning themselves not with the actual shapes themselves, but rather the properties they have. A common joke is that topologists can't tell the difference between a coffee cup and a donut, because one can be continuously deformed using what's called a homeomorphism, until it looks just like the other. Non-orientable surfaces like the Mirbia strip, which has only one side, and the Klein bottle, which has no inside and no outside, challenge our intuitive notions about geometric shapes. A particularly interesting subfield of geometric topology is knot theory, which studies knots in a mathematical way, how we can unravel a seemingly complicated knot and have it actually be a much simpler one. Believe it or not, knot theory actually has applications today in chemistry and biology when looking at the very DNA that makes us who we are. There are many more interesting fields of mathematics that you could explore. By no means has this been an exhaustive list of all fields of mathematics, but hopefully you should have some kind of idea of what direction you might want to go to continue your studies. So that's it for this lecture, and for that matter, this course. I hope that you've come to understand mathematics as not merely a collection of equations, formulas, and processes, but rather as a living, breathing thing, full of interconnected concepts, each of which brings new ideas to the table, and yet provides a deeper explanation of what we already know. Thank you for joining me, and good luck studying mathematics in the future.